So you may have noticed, we talk a lot about the presence of God in this church. Because we see it as truly the greatest gift that's been given to us. That actually every good thing in life that we experience first comes from the presence of God. Because he himself is love and he gives himself out of that love. So that we can, one, just enjoy his presence. But that in that we find who we really are. We find that we ourselves can be made new. We find that we are given even greater purpose. And all of that's an overflow of the presence of God. However, being in his presence also then requires ourselves to be present. Which obviously is increasingly more difficult in today's day and age. But we all know this. We've seen the studies. It's, it's not a Christian conversation anymore. Um, it's just kind of a global conversation that our intention spans are rapidly decreasing. Right? Our, our ability and really the demand on us to multitask is ever increasing. Obviously, all the increased uses of tech, uh, which I don't even need to go into, we understand that. That right now, it's so easy to be a million different places except for right here and present. And our desire, as you maybe are exploring, or maybe you are, and we are stepping in to be a follower of Jesus, is not only to just be someone who's present and in the moment, but to be a people who are present with him. We want to form our lives around an ongoing conversation that we have with God to walk and talk and move, as the word says, in step with the spirit of God. That's what we're, we're after in a lifestyle. And in many ways, that's what prayer in, in all of its different forms really is. Prayer and actually presence and being present go hand in hand because prayer is something truly, ultimately, that we need to understand is something that just needs to be fully participated in. It's a live conversation with a live and living and active God. And so if you take this idea that we talk about all the time in the church about the presence of God, and if we take that out of the conversation that we're having about prayer, what we're, we're left with really is just a bunch of our own angst, a bunch of our own worries, our, I, our own ideas, our own desires, and then a lot of kind of liturgical practices and language that go along with that. You see, true prayer, what we are after, the kind of transcendent, amazing, powerful kind of prayer that changes life requires both the presence of God and it requires us to be present. It requires us to be still as we pull from the text today. To sit, to listen, and to be present. Because ultimately prayer is rooted in relationship. Right? It is rooted in communication. We all know that any marriage seminar you've ever been to or any conversation you've read about a quality, healthy relationship always talks about how communication is key. And perhaps more than anything else, prayer is one of those realities where we need to understand this about communication. Knowledge is not power. And I would say that again about prayer. Knowledge is not power. But the power and the significance and the impact of prayer doesn't come about from knowing about prayer, and it doesn't come about from knowing how to pray. The power and the impact of prayer comes from praying. So knowledge is not power. Now, yes, we can declare and know the promises of God, but again, knowing about prayer and praying are two, two very different things. And then in audacious as a claim as it is, this is the claim that the mere opening of our hearts the uttering of our lips, even in our own imperfect desires and wants as we desire to surrender them unto the will of the Father. And as we cry out to him and we surrender our minds and we wait in his presence and we listen and as we hear from him, we speak his truth back to him through prayer, that undoubtedly is the single most impactful thing that a human being can participate in. And it has been throughout history. There was a uh, doctoral student once at Princeton who asked this what is there left in the world for original dissertation research? And Albert Einstein replied to him, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. You see, prayer is powerful and it's frustrating. It's something we, I think, long for, participate in it at times. We believe in and yet we're always stepping in, into it and we're stepping out of it. It's the catalyst for great miracles and it's also the hinge upon some of our biggest questions and our biggest doubts. No one understands those better than David, right? 
the most prolific writer in scripture that we have of, of worship songs, of songs, of prayers. And yet he was the king of the nation of Israel, the broken and flawed husband, the broken and flawed leader. But at the same time was the man after God's own heart who restored the heart of worship back to the people of God. He restored honor back to God. He restored the call of the people back into the presence of God. And it was this man that wrote, be still and know that I am God. And you think you're busy and you think you're stressed and you think we, we struggle with all the things that we have to do to stay focused and present. David was the king of a nation during a time of constant warfare. He, he would go to bed at night and wake up in the morning wondering if there's armies camped around ready to attack the city that he was in charge of. He oversaw the armies. He oversaw the government. And he was also tasked with spiritually leading the nation and drawing them back to God and creating a space for the temple of the Lord to reside. And in the midst of all of that, he found a way to be still, to enter into God's presence, to know God, and to allow himself to be known, which sometimes was great for him and sometimes was not, not an easy road. And the call for us then today is to understand a little bit more, is my hope, to be still, to know God, and to allow God to know us. And as we've alluded to, um, Already this morning, it's a lot harder task uh, than maybe it sounds sometimes. Um, I, I saw a mug the other day that just had like, be still and know that I'm God. It was like a thrift store mug, clearly, that somebody's grandma from the Christian bookstore had sent them, and it had not made it. <laughs> um, it's something we toss around and we throw around, but there's actually great depth and great power in that verse as you read it in the context that we saw from Psalm 46 today. That's, that's in the midst of the nation's warring of wars across the globe that this call to be still and know that I am God comes in. So let's talk about being still and be present. Let's be honest and real about our cultural moment today, right, about this idea of knowing and being known. And that idea is already so hard, obviously, on personal levels and spiritual levels for us. Um, but it's also just difficult to know and be known, to be still and to be present, simply because how our culture has wired us. So there's an author, Adele Calhoun, who speaks on spiritual disciplines a lot, which is, she's amazing about that. So things like stillness, contemplation, examine, regular times of prayer, couldn't recommend her work more. She wrote this, no wonder contemplation has fallen on hard times. In a world where people anchor their identity on the shifting seas of performance and accomplishments, contemplation seems inefficient and too unproductive for the daily grind. You resonate? Let me help frame this cultural moment a little bit more for us by taking us all the way back to the year 1370. Now, this is some research compiled by a pastor named John Mark uh, Comer out of Portland. And when he framed it this way, I was like, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. That helps me speak to our moment and see it in a better light. See, in Germany in 1370, that's the year that, that the first clock was put on public display. Right, 1370 in Germany, that's the moment in history that we look back to where humanity started measuring time artificially instead of measuring time naturally. Which means that before that moment in time, we ordered our lives around the natural world, sun up and sun down, which means there were seasons of life when days were longer and nights were shorter. Then there were seasons of life in, in the year where the nights were longer and we slept more because of it. But then in this time period, the rhythm of life began to change. And in many ways, the rhythm of humanity began to change as people began to live according to the beat of their own rhythm now, not the rhythm of the created world. So jump, jump several hundred more years forward, 1879. Any history buffs here in this? Thomas Edison, first light bulb. And among all the changes that this brought about, obviously it could go on and on, one of them that's devastating for us to hear was the average sleep time for individuals was drastically cut down. So get this, this blew my mind. Prior to the light bulb, the average sleep time for an American was 11 to 11 and a half hours a night. Come on, you gotta be kidding me. What a, what a wonderful world. Um, and then of course, since 1879 and the light bulb, technology has just continued to take off and take over in just drastic ways in the way it's changed our lives. So I'm gonna jump us to the 1960s. Okay, there were sociologists that really began discussing in the 60s all these advancements that are taking place in our culture, in particular around these ideas of time-saving technology. They began to envision what life may look like in the future. 
And across the board, sociologists agreed on this. This is what they were on the same page on. People were going to have so much leisure time on their hands in the future. So, so far, in 1967 then, a Senate subcommittee, right? The Senate predicts that by 1985, the average American will have a 22-hour work week for 27 weeks a year because of all the time-saving technology that we're going to have in play at that time. Who here is working a 22-hour work week? 27 weeks a year? Come on. Instead, obviously, the reality is over that time period, and it's not even that it stayed static, the average American now, their leisure time has decreased by 37% since then. And the truth is this. On some level, that Senate subcommittee was correct. Technology has saved us so much time. It's opened up so many doors. It's freed up so much extra time and opportunity. However, what the sociologists of the 1960s got entirely wrong was not in predicting how much time we were going to be able to save. What they got wrong was predicting how humanity was going to spend that time. Which ultimately leads us to today, right? Our present age. I was doing a little bit of study on it lately that brought me awareness around a, a term being used more and more by mental health professionals. It's called hurry sickness. Apparently it's a thing. This is how they define it. It's a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness an overwhelming and continual sense of urgency. Or you could just say, New York City. Our present moment is increasingly more being defined and marked by hurry, not by presence. We talked about last week, right, the rise of anxiety disorders and how just staggeringly high that is. And obviously, you can see the correlation. I love what one author uh, said about hurry sickness uh, and that kind of thing that they've been seeing in culture, um, in the present flow of how our culture is going. He said this, there's a reason it's called breakneck speed. Think about that one for a moment. Okay, so in the midst of that reality, that is where we hear this morning, this call to be still. Now I'm just going to add one more dimension to it. At the same time as life has massively hurried up and productivity and connectivity has all skyrocketed, skyrocketed, at the same time, unfortunately, human connection with each other and with God has decreased, which is devastating, as you might guess, emotionally and psychologically and spiritually, as we all as human beings are carrying an innate desire inside of us for a relationship. We were made to see and be seen, to know and be known. That is who we are. In 2010, um, there's an art exhibit that went into the MoMA here in New York, and it was called The Artist is Present. I think it's an interesting way to look at this idea. Uh, the artist was a woman named Marina Abramovich, and basically as part of the install, one section in the MoMA was set apart for her to do a performance art piece. And what she did was she would sit in a chair there for eight hours a day with an empty chair across from her. And people were invited to come and just sit across from her and maintain eye contact with her. Now, upon inception of the, the install, they were a little worried about this exhibit. They were wondering, are people actually even going to sit down? Are they going to make eye contact uh, and participate? Will they actually take the time to do this, much less to actually do this with a total stranger? Well, it turns out a lot of people were interested. Because for three months, the exhibit was open for eight hours each day, and the seat across from Marina was never empty for more than a minute. People would actually wait in line for this opportunity. Over a thousand New Yorkers took part waiting for their turn to sit across from Marina with sustained eye contact. The artist explained after that it was a complete surprise, this enormous need of humans to have contact. Right? This longing is part of who we are, to know and be known, to see and be seen. Genesis 1, from the get-go, God said, let us, this relational triune God, make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And that's how we were made, in the likeness of God, to be then image bearers, to reflect that image then to the world. So, so think of your core identity as the same relationship that the moon has to the sun, and the sun is God. right? To, see, to be ones that see God as he sees us and to reflect that image out into the world. Therefore, for us to then be a people that lives in the presence of God, 
to, to be a people that is endeavoring, which what we're doing here, to rewire the way that we're racing through life. We need to be intentional and develop practices in our life that literally allow us to rewire our time and our focus and the rhythm of our days. And as we've been saying, which makes sense then here, prayer is more practice than theory. It's not a theory, it's a practice that we will step into that will change us. You can actually practice the presence of God. And there are numerous, numerous practices about being attentive and stepping in and praying around this idea. Uh, the past few weeks, we talked about true worship. We talked about praise. We talked about adoration and entering in and how, how God uses that as a way to enter into his presence. And how that's all worked out through prayer and singing. And it's actually really a lifestyle of worship that you can ultimately develop. And today, I want to draw us a little further back towards some practices taken from the contemplative tradition, almost kind of swinging to the other side, because we are a diverse community, and it's so great to draw from all the different streams. And these practices in particular are so important because they involve just you and God. They're practices that draw you into your inner life, the life of the heart, the life of the soul, into the presence of God so that you may know him and be known by him. So these are things like fixed hour prayer, Silence, examine, contemplation, confession. And obviously, you, if you've been around the church world at all, you've heard these things. They may not be new to you. But in fact, there, there is a rich history in all of these throughout the church. From the earliest church to the present day, they've all followed this rhythm of an intentionality to their prayer life in particular. Right? And I think we sometimes view in, in 2019 like relationship is all just organic. And so obviously relationship with God should be the same way. But they, there is this sense that part of a, a developing true authentic relationship re requires an intentionality, a surrender, a sacrifice, and a, and a choice to step in. So you may s s um, associate some of those practices I listed with like the monks or the desert fathers because that's usually who get the most play when you think of fixed hour prayer or uh, contemplative prayer and these different practices which are becoming increasingly more popular in today's day and age, which probably is due to the hectic nature of our culture. But actually what I wanted to point out to us is actually that this idea of an intentional times of prayer, of setting time apart, has been there from the earliest days of the church. So Acts 3, Peter and John, and you don't always see this inherently in the text. So in three, Acts 3, Peter and John, they're on their way traveling to a specific time of prayer. The text says at 3 in the afternoon they are going to pray. And that's when they come across the lame beggar and we get that amazing story. In Acts 10, Peter was in the midst of what he said was his afternoon prayer. Again, around 3 p.m. So apparently he was pretty consistent in these times he chose to pray, right? And that's when he received the call from the angel to go and meet with Cornelius. In Acts 10, 9, Peter's taking time, this time at noon, to pray. And we read that he goes up on the roof in order to do so. So essentially what's happening, he's stopping at noon, he's finding a place, and he's choosing to pray and be in the presence of God. And it's during that noontime prayer session that he gets that vision of the food laws being fulfilled. That's right. We literally get to eat bacon today because he took some time to pray at noon and have a quiet time. Praise the Lord. Right? Acts 10.30. Cornelius was praying also at 3 p.m., it says in the text. During his afternoon prayer time, that's when God confirmed to him that he's going to meet with Peter. I mentioned all that stuff to say just from everyone from David to Jesus who always stole away at specific times to the apostles to the monks to the desert fathers to countless believers today. They find life and health in setting aside specific time to pray throughout their days and throughout their weeks. I believe it is something that we should all very seriously take to heart. And if it's not part of our rhythm, I think it's something we should truly consider making part of our regular rhythm. And I just say this, right? It's one of those things Genevieve and I were talking about this week. It's, it's one of those things that we all resonate with and we say yes and we nod our heads, but it's so hard to change the practices of our life and create change. But my heart then for today's teaching, the rest of it, is I want to get really practical and walk us through this practice. Um, because when it comes to prayer, remember, it is all about practice. It's all about doing it. It's not about knowing about it. It's not about knowing how. It's not even about theologically agreeing with the concepts and the power of prayer. It's about participating in prayer. And so first, really practical, I want to say, what does it look like to dip your toe into the water of contemplative prayer? Into a contemplative practice around presence or something like fixed hour prayer? Which essentially, by the way, fixed hour prayer just means setting a specific time to go and pray. So that's step one. 
set a specific time to go and pray. And it doesn't have to be three times throughout the day. Let it be the duration and the quantity that you feel comfortable with. The key is this. Set the time and commit to showing up. Set the time, like it's a time on your calendar, and commit to showing up. And then there, there's this. I really recommend this. Set a timer. I find this to be really helpful, especially if you're brand new to this, because it's so easy to get so distracted, and we also just um, sometimes get anxious in silence, part of the reality of our time right now, too. And so if you've set a timer, the beauty of that, it, it lets you to set that time apart. Because ideally, you set that timer and you put your device on airplane mode, uh, and you don't have to get worried about missing out on work things or family things because you've set that timer for five minutes or 20 minutes or 60 minutes, whatever you've decided, and you know you're going to be alerted uh, to be brought out. So just set the timer and let your guard down. You may think that's rigid, but honestly, it's freeing. Oftentimes, when we add structure into our prayer life, we're then more freed up to be ourselves and to be present in that moment. Structure actually can bring freedom. Whatever it takes to be still and to be present, that's going to be a win for you in this. Okay, then maybe you're saying, all right, I've set the time, I've showed up, I've got my timer set, now what do I do? Well, I would say first, just spend a few minutes stilling yourself, being present, it's a practice. Um, I'll walk us through a little bit deeper uh, in, a, in a moment here about how you actually still yourself in a, in a greater way. But I also recommend there you can just even begin by like reading scripture, filling your head with something different, or just being present with Jesus. Then what I find is helpful, especially in this idea, because we're saying this is fixed hour prayer. Maybe you said, I, I'm going to do it at 10 a.m., or I'm going to do it at noon, or I'm going to do it at 3. Um, so you're coming in into this moment, and maybe you only have 10 minutes set apart. And all these things going on in your head, all these things going on in your mind, and now you need to just step into this kind of awareness and presence and prayer. Give yourself prompts to get into that kind of prayer. This is so, so helpful. Um, you, can, you can have a previously written prayer that you kind of start with that is a catalyst or a jumping off point or maybe a liturgy that you've pulled. Um, you can take a section of scripture and pray that. One great thing to do if you just don't know what to do, you use the Lord's Prayer and then as you hit each one of those prompts in the prayer, um, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Use that as a jumping off point. Start praising him. Start, start just giving his glory. You know, ask for pr provision. All those things are a jumping off point. Um, and then you can have... Um, Prompts to like keep you planned. This is something I've talked to some people who, who always do this, which I find is fascinating. Uh, they have like specific prayers or specific verses. So like, they have like, this is my getting dressed prayer. And every time I get dressed, I open with this specific prayer. Like keep me in this place. Or this is my commuting to the train uh, verse. And I recite this verse all the time as I commute to the train. And I set myself with this. Right? This is my lunchtime prayer that I do. And it's just like three main points that I've written out. And I just open up to that. And it just like focuses me. In some level, this is what we're doing as a church corporately as well. On Wednesdays in the midweek, we join together at 8 a.m. and we join together at noon. That's open to everybody. Where we come in, we set everything aside, we worship, we go get into the presence of God, and we intercede and we pray. And that's just a great start for you, perhaps. Maybe to do it corporately and with others, to, it, to come in and, and rearrange that this one day a week in the middle of the week, you set that time apart to come and join God's people. Or just know that we're gathering in those times, and maybe you can't get to us in LIC, and just decide on Wednesdays from noon to one or from eight to nine, I'm going to do this hour of prayer, um, and I'll just know it that I'm going to do it in unity with my church that's also gathering and praying in that time. It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you set it and you start to show up. And as you begin to build these times of stillness and awareness into your day, the more you're going to start to carry God with you in all of your circumstances. This kind of practice actually opens the door to what many call a rightly ordered life. It actually then, as you step into this on a regular basis, it will unlock greater power in your prayer life. Because as you step into this, it puts prayer in the rightful place, which is this. Prayer is there to determine the way that you live your life. Right? You find yourself in the presence, and from there, you are guided into the way you live your life, as opposed to the way many people uh, often view prayer, devout Christians, they use prayer as the fuel to live the life that they're already living. Right? I'm living this life, and i got to go in prayer and have these asks and these needs, these wants to then fuel to do what I'm already doing, as opposed to what we're suggesting here is to begin in the place of presence and to allow that to dictate the way that you live your life. That's part of the act of contemplation. 
Still yourselves. Enter in. Know God. And it is from there that you will find truth. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines that word to contemplate as this, to view or consider with continued attention. Right? And it involves an awareness, ch- choosing to notice, considering, pondering, continued attention, to give our thoughts and our heart and our minds in a sustained way over to who God is. Right? It's the, the, actually the absolute antithesis of a sound bite, to contemplate. Contemplation is not just a one-time thing. It's a continual thing we are called into in the area of focusing on who God is, to know him. And so I'm going to get practical again for us. Um, because, again, so it's these things that we talk about we don't always step into. I want to take us deeper into that idea of then how do we become present. I'm going to work through this practically on how it may work out for you in the midweek. Um, and, again, I'm going to glean this practice from Adele Calhoun, the woman I mentioned earlier. It's a practice called Palms Up and Palms Down. So we're going to practice it right now. You're already sitting, so that's great. You're in a place of stillness. But I encourage you, right? Get more comfortable. Root your feet on the floor. I encourage you to close your eyes just to avoid distraction, but you don't have to. And take just one big, deep breath in and one big, deep breath out. So say it's in the middle of your work week, right? So you've you've either pulled away to a corner of your office or you found a a park bench um, or maybe you're at the corner of a coffee shop. And you've created your moment, you've set your timer. I want you just to begin right now to contemplate Jesus. Continued attention on Jesus. You're intentionally placing yourself in the presence of God to be still. You can even share that in your heart. Like, my intention, God, is to rest in your love. And you can use your imagination. This helps me. Right? You can picture yourself leaning up against Jesus like John did. You know, or you picture yourself like Mary who is sitting at his feet, just being attentive. You can picture yourself kneeling and bowing down. And it's fine to have distractions and thoughts and things that interrupt. And there's always going to be a million noises in this city. And that's fine. Or things that creep into your mind. And you just let them go. And you just begin again with the process. You're receiving God's gift of new beginnings that he promises. Now I want you to turn your palms down. Like go ahead and just like place them on your lap, like palms facing down. So you stay in this place. And as you do that, what this practice is, is symbolizing is that you're, you're dropping your cares. You're dropping your worries. Drop the agenda that you have, your expectations, even of what this moment's going to be like with Jesus. Anything that's burdensome, any of those, those go-to anxieties that you know you have in your life that always bubble up when you give yourself a moment of stillness, just let those go into Jesus' hand. And again, just breathe deeply. And now as you've, you've given your cares to Jesus, I want you to turn your palms up onto your lap there and just open your hands up to receive God's presence, to receive his word, to listen for his love and to experience his love. Remember his promises. Did he love you? That he chose you. That he promises to see his good works through to completion, those works that he began in you. Be reminded that you're his child, that you're forgiven, that he adores you. And then as you feel prompted, you can tell the Lord what it's like for you actually simply to be with him in this moment. For now, let's just simply say thank you and amen. Amen. That took less than three minutes for us, I believe. Um, simple time. And I would say from there, a couple of minutes of that, that simple practice. From there, you can begin to step into perhaps those verses or those prayers or those prompts that you've provided for yourself for that moment. Uh, it's from there that you can open the word of God for a, for a devotional or to read along where you've been reading. But you know that you're now doing it, talking to him, asking, sharing, listening, knowing that he is with you and he's guiding you in that process. And I would just say this, what we just did in that idea of specific, alone, set apart time for God is really, really important if you are longing to become mature as a Christian. So for any of you who are um, longing to be um, mature in your faith. There's people in this church I know who are hungering for more. 
Maybe there's a lot of things that you're, you're longing for breakthrough. You want to be formed more into the in image of Jesus. You sense that there is more for you in this life and in the spirit. Intentional set-apart time with God where you give him your full attention is so, so important and necessary because it's all about intimacy with God. And as you give him your undivided focus, as you draw near to him, he draws near to you. As you walk and talk as a person in relationship with Jesus, you show up and you make him your primary focus. It will begin to change your prayer life. It will begin to change your spiritual authority. It changes prayer from just being like the spiritual discipline that you check the box on to being a person that's actually continually walking and aware of God's movement and activity in the world and in, in through you. It's an amazing shift that begins to take place as you make this a part of your rhythm. Now, the third, um, the third thing I want to talk about in this type of prayer and practice is this. We said it's like it's be still. It's know that I am God, and then it's also this idea of then part of knowing in Scripture is also being known. So we're talking about real relationship here. So we're saying, hey, the call for us is to be still, to know God first, and as we know him, to allow ourselves to be known. And this brings up a lot of stuff for a lot of people. One, and not the least of which, is this idea of confession, and I know even me just saying the word confession for some of you brings up probably a lot of different pictures and ideas and feelings. But hear this, the heart of true confession is honesty, vulnerability, and trust. It's an opening up of your full self to God, which is what we are endeavoring to do. Right? Allowing ourselves to be known so that he can heal and so that he can forgive. Because that's his gracious promise. Packer uh, says this, um, what matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. I am graven on the palm of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. That is such a healthy image and truth to hold on to that was just articulated for us. Because it's from that place of understanding that God already knows everything about you. He cares for you. He sees you. There's nowhere that you can go where he's not going to be right there with you. It's from that place that you actually enter into confession and full honesty and transparency. Because truthfully, you have nothing to hide. Because here's the reality. There are no secrets in the secret place. Now sometimes we, we act like we can hide from God. Sometimes we actually try and hide from God. There's a reluctance that bubbles up inside of us that we carry because uh, we don't want to fully uncover ourselves before God. We're reluctant to step into the kind of prayer, another honest and bold prayer of David, Psalm 139, when he says, search me and know me in my inmost being. Right? Find, search me. Is there any wrong way within me? I want, I want to be known. And sometimes we're afraid to step into that because we are ashamed or we're intentionally not wanting to be found. And that is a, a truthful and honest response, too. I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat that. That's real. We all experience that and we feel that. In fact, that's, that's the most ancient of responses of humanity. From the very first sin, original sin, Adam and Eve in the garden, that was their first response, too. Hiding and shame. They searched for fig leaves to cover up their nakedness. They didn't want to be exposed. They actually literally then began to hide themselves from God. And then as he's calling out to them, they begin to justify and blame one another or blame the enemy. The, anything that they could do to not just blame themselves. I love what Scott Saul says about this. He says, the story of Adam and Eve is also the story of us. We know that we aren't what we should be. So we hide, we blame, we run for cover and look out for number one. When shame knocks on our door, in desperation we create counter narratives to silence it. We grasp for something to tell us that everything is okay that we are okay. We will use anything, good looks, status, career, family, humor, friendships, religion, sex, influence, or a financial portfolio to rewrite our stories. Desperately, we attempt to take shame out of our stories and replace it with these things we depend on to validate us. But it's only a matter of time before the validating fig leaves let us down. 
And therefore, with our shame and with our guilt, we often don't step into the presence of God. We don't allow ourselves to be fully known and to know him in vulnerability because we're afraid. We hide because we think God is displeased with us or he's going to smite us or he's going to turn away from us. When honestly, I believe probably what is hurting him the most is simply the fact that we're hiding from him. And what I've found is that actually God is so gentle, and I'm just so grateful and thankful for this in the times in my life, um, especially when you're in times of places of shame and guilt, when you know you are trying to prop yourself with these other things, when you feel less than, when you have done things that you wish you had not, God is actually exponentially more kind and gentle in those moments as you are willing to just come before him and be real and say, hey, dad, I screwed up. Because he actually, the picture that we're given in the aftermath of original sin, right, isn't the picture of God as this angry father who comes barging into the garden and dragging Adam and Eve out of the, uh, the bushes where they're hiding to punish them. No, we actually see him exactly where he's always been. He's walking in the garden, waiting to meet with them, and he's calling their names. He knows what they've done. He knows what has just happened. He probably knows exactly where they're hiding but he's gentle and he's gracious, just like he is with you and me. And he lets us remain in hiding. That's what I think is so fascinating. He lets them remain in hiding, and he just keeps calling their names. So whatever that thing is that you're hiding in your life right now, perhaps it's a, a moment you're ashamed of, or even a, a, a doubt you're carrying about your identity or your faith or what God is up to, and you're pretending that just, that isn't just really there, he already knows it. And he loves you anyway. He actually went to the cross knowing it. In fact, that's, that's the reason he went to the cross altogether. So that you could be free. So that you could freely come to him in intimacy. You and him, one on one. And lay bare the secrets of your heart to him. And he in turn can say, hey, come, sit on my lap. Tell me everything. I'm going to offer you grace and mercy and healing and forgiveness. There's no need to doctor yourself up in the presence of God. And make yourself look better than you really are. The call is simply to show up and meet with him face to face, to take time to know him and to be known. So look, I'll just close with this idea. We're not talking about just stepping into some liturgical practice here when we're talking about prayer. It's not just a time of rhythm and reflection because that's what Christians should do or that's what good mindful humans do. We're not even just talking about being emotionally healthy human beings and having practices of mindfulness and meditation. Though that's a good thing, and, and that's a part of it, emotional health and mindfulness. There's a reason that's even popular in, in, in all spheres right now. But truthfully, it is so much more. By participating in examine, self-examine, confession, entering into contemplation and reflection, what we're doing is we're participating in holy relationship. We're entering into the presence of God. And here's the key. When we do this, when we do the practice that we just did this morning, when you step into those times of prayer, the Holy Spirit is there with you. The Holy Spirit resides inside of you. The Holy Spirit is an active part of that process. The Spirit guides and intercedes. That's at the identity of the Spirit. He's not just a giver of gifts. He's a guider. Right? Jesus said this himself about the Spirit that he's promising is the ultimate gifts, gift. He says when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. He is going to be your guide. That, 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 that truth that will be revealed to you is the work of God going on in your life. And the Spirit is there to illuminate that. As you take time to contemplate and open yourself up to that, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and guides you into truth. So as you allow yourself to sit in that chair across from God, and making eye contact with him, you'll find truth. And the truth is that you are infinitely loved. And sometimes that truth leads to conviction and it feels uncomfortable. I, really, it, it, it hurts. It can hurt. It can be painful. But the kind of conviction that comes from the spirit, that comes from sitting across from God and looking him into the eyes, is never about condemnation. It's always about healing. So yes, it hurts because you're sitting in truth and you're being revealed. Uh, pain is being revealed. It's being exposed. And God steps in and he heals because that's his nature. Healing's his very nature. He's bringing you into a place of freedom and abundance. Second Corinthians says, godly sorrow brings about repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. It's actually worldly sorrow that brings about death, not godly sorrow. 
right? To know and be known. To, to true authenticity, authenticity before God, right? That's what we're after. Because when you allow yourself to truly see, right, to behold, to know God, to see him for who he is, to see him for what he has done and what he promises to do, it's there that your journey for truly knowing yourself begins. It's in knowing your creator that you begin to understand what you were created for. And that takes place, and as that takes place, you begin to step into your authority, which is powerful. You begin to step into your understanding that you are beloved, that you are bought with a price, that you are his, that you are a child, that you are an heir, that you are infinitely loved, that you are chosen, and that he will be with you to the end. I just want to pray blessing over us as we take this time to just soak and be in his presence. Holy Father, we love you. And I even just ask God, like, we believe, but would you even help our unbelief? God, would you form something in us, God? I pray a blessing over this church right now, over all of us, Lord, that we would be a people that would truly rewire our our minds. We would rewire our days and our schedules down to the most practical, God, that we would literally elevate everything as sacred. Right now, we speak against that divide that exists between the sacred and the secular. We declare everything over your creation as yours, Jesus, everything over our life as yours. God, and I ask right now that you would come in in each heart here and and, and like sow a seed of vision of what a life to walk in step with the Spirit may look like. What that kind of peace may look like. What that kind of purpose may look like for you. What, What that kind of life without regret may look like for you. That kind of life where you don't carry shame over the areas where you've screwed up. That kind of life where you have confidence in who you are and who you were created to be. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you, would you breathe your new mercies over us this morning as we worship? Amen.